I'm very pleased to introduce our next speaker, an electronics engineer who's actively involved in the open source movement, and he's been a writer for Hackaday. <laughs> he specializes in designing products from scratch, some of which he lists on Tindy, with over 2,000 orders under his belt. And you're hardly ever out of stock. I consider you to be one of our best sellers. <laughs> Today, he's going to talk about the open source project, which he and 50 other collaborators uh, brought, to, brought to the market. And they also sell it on Tindy. In 2013, in 2013 his favorite hardware tool was his infrared preheating plate. I wonder what it is today. <laughs> Please welcome to the Hackaday Super Conference stage, Mathieu Stepan. Hello. Can you hear the strong French accent? Okay. The microphone is working then. So uh, today we're going to talk about passwords, uh, particularly the multipass offline password keeper. A uh, quick show of hands. Does anyone know the multipass? Okay. Let's say 40%. That's cool. At the end of this presentation, it will be 100% at least. So my name is Mathieu Stefan. I'm an embedded systems engineer. I was a writer for Hackaday for a year and a half, I think. And I'm the Multipass project founder. Uh, so I'm going to go quickly. We have 46 slides and 30 minutes. It's going to be quick. So what is the Multipass? The Multipass basically is a small device that you, can show, that you can see here that is dedicated to storing your login and passwords as well as small files. We offer a native browser integration. So basically, we have plugins for Firefox, uh, Safari, and Chrome. Uh, the device, the multipass, is recognized as a keyboard, which means that you can connect it on any device that may be uh, smartphones, tablets, and computers. And it will type for you logins and passwords. And of course, it's open software and hardware. So internally, what does the multipass look like? Well, it's just. Uh, Big box composed of uh, microcontrollers, some OLED screen, flash memory, and a clickable wheel for user interaction. And it does use a pin lock smart card that contains the encryption key uh, to encrypt all your credentials. So concretely, what does it look like? You go to a website, uh, then the multipass is going to light up and ask you to approve uh, the request to log in. So here you can see the knock detecting feature that we implemented, but you can also use the clickable wheel to approve the request. And previously I mentioned that it is recognized as a keyboard, so you can use the user interface on the multipass to select the, uh, the website for, on which you want to log in. So in this example, it is Skype on my phone using a USB on the go cable. So, uh, now we have talked about the multipass, but the goal of this presentation mainly is to maybe give you some tips. Uh, if you have an idea in the back of your head, you want to manufacture it, uh, sell it on Tindy, uh, go through Kickstarter, Indiegogo, raise some funds in order to start a mass production. Uh, so I will use this presentation uh, as an example of the different uh, obstacles you will encounter. And uh, more importantly, uh, if your project is big enough that you can't do it alone, uh, we're going to see how you can find contributors and how you can get other people interested in what you're doing in order to have a project composed of many people from all over the globe. And it's OK. So starting the project. So you have an idea. Uh, you want to work on it. You want to find other people uh, to contribute to it. How do you start? So at the time, I was lucky enough uh, to be a writer for Hackaday. So you may remember the first articles uh, named uh, Developed on Hackaday. Uh, so basically, I had this idea for an offline password keeper. I wrote a small article on Hackaday, say, hey, let's build that. Are you interested in contributing? So just a quick article. Uh, we received more than 30 applications. Uh, for these applications, people have had many very different interests. So how are you going to uh, tell them, okay, you can work on this or on that? So for this particular project, of course, you want to keep people motivated. So if you have someone contacting you, hey, I want to work on that part of the firmware, if he granted he has enough spare time to contribu contribute on that task, you're going to give him that task and, of course, try to manage him to, in order to have a good result. Uh, so this is actually how we assign the different tasks uh, on the different contributors that applied. And one main uh, problem is that, of course, I mentioned people working from all over the globe. I'm located personally in Switzerland. Right now, for me, it's midnight, so I'm a bit jet lagged. Uh, but of course, if you're working, uh, for example, the worst case for me was this guy here, uh, which is 12 hours difference for me. 
communicating with him is quite challenging. So how do you do that? Uh, first, you establish ground rules. Uh, everyone has their own coding practices, tabs versus spaces. It's always an eternal debate. You have 30 people with 30 different opinions. First, you need to make sure that every, everyone agrees on the same ground rules, otherwise you're going to lose a lot of people very quickly. Uh, so in our case, uh, this is what we agreed on. It took a month for everyone to agree. Uh, you want to contribute to different uh, parts of the project as long as everyone is happy with it. You, uh, you may have encountered, encountered in your professional life someone that always has the best idea, but which is he's, he's a, bit, a bit in his word. But, you know, you can't really integrate his work like that. So right from the beginning, you need to make sure that people will submit to the will of the group of the developers. So basically, we're not, uh, we just let developers say, hey, maybe you can work on that particular part to make sure that actually he's not going com completely up in a different direction that you want him to be. Uh, use GitHub for code versioning and control. Document everything. You have contributors. They may come one day and leave the other. So it, it is, of course, way easier if the guy replacing him after uh, has some documentation to, uh, to uh, better work on it. I know that we don't like write, writing documentation, but unfortunately, we have to do it. Uh, and these are details work in a dedicated, dedicated file or folder to avoid merge conflicts. Group communications. Uh, you, may have, you, you may have seen the map. People are coming from all over the globe, so you don't want to use any direct communication means. Uh, in our cases, we, uh, we really used uh, Google Groups, or in the worst case, IRC, in order to leave a trace of the different technical choices we had made. You want to make sure that uh, everyone has access to the information and every everyone feels involved in the project as a whole. People are spread all over the globe. Um, you don't know what is going on in their life. You want to keep them motivated. So actually, if you show their work regularly, on Hacker Day in our case, you keep them involved. And actually, it's great to see that what you're doing is actually going somewhere and it's, everyone can see it. It's some kind of, you're building up your resume, in the, for example. So management in infrastructure. So the multipass. It may look simple, but it is really not. Uh, we have graphics, we have encryption, we have many different tasks. And so you want to make sure that at a given point in the project, you have a global overview of where your project is at. You want to make sure, okay, maybe we are lagging behind on that particular task. So in the case of the multipass, we use the Trello board. Basically, for each task, you have a small, uh, uh, I don't know how you call that, a small frame. Uh, so you can actually see what's going on. And if someone has some spare time and wants to work on something uh, that is available for the taking, you could just go on the board and say, okay, I'm going to take care of that. And I'm going to talk maybe with this other contributor uh, to make sure that I'm not like, doing something that he has already done. Uh, yeah, so this is management uh, tricks. I'm not sure if you're interested in that, but uh, of course, if we are all human beings. We, all have our own sensibilities. So actually it's good to have really to explicit the, the rules to work together. So in, in our case, uh, so we didn't come up with that. Uh, this is just like we, we agreed on rules and then found out that actually it was similar to the Kanban process. So basically we want to really push people to do what they want to do, uh, really make them, make them involved in their work and like uh, wish them to give, give them all their means to do what they want to do, as long as it is within the framework of the multipass. So now the management part is over. We are going to get to the interesting stuff. It's going to get very low level. Uh, multipass hardware. So I spent a lot of time hand soldering the different prototypes we had. Uh, you, when you develop a project, you don't want to wait for two months for, for a batch to be assembled, especially if you may have done some mistakes on the design files. Uh, so as a general rule, you want to design a product. Uh, design, if you're good with SkyCAD or Eagle, uh, design the schematics layout, uh, have it produced wherever, and learn to solve the QFNs and see if, if that works. So in our case, I hand assembled the prototypes. 
and ship them over to the contributors. This way, they could start working as quickly as possible and they could play. And in the meantime, other people could work on having a better layout, a better case design, while the other could work on the source code. The case choice. So all these parts that I mentioned before were on hackerday.com. Uh, we were made, making an article every two or three weeks, something like that. And we did not, uh, what to say, we, the different designs for the, for the case, we uh, let the Hackaday readership choose. So we called for different, in this case, we called for different case designs. And several months later, we asked the readership, okay, which one do you prefer? Uh, this is how the multipass original was uh, picked. I guess it had 40% of the vote for the case. Uh, we ran the first crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo for 120K, I think, something like that. And because people were starting to warm up to the idea of having a small, a dedicated device for storing their credentials and files with them rather than trusting blinding, blindly their computer, we developed a small version, a smaller version of the Multipass, the Multipass Mini. Uh, you, that is made using an aluminum frame. Uh, we got funded exactly a year ago, 300%. Three, We're very happy. Uh, aluminum frame, why? Because uh, the complete security model of our device relies on the fact that uh, it, any attempt made on the frame would be uh, visible. So any time someone wants to open it, you would see some marks on the, on the case. So to make everyone happy, this is me trying to pry open the case by standing on, uh, on the case itself, uh, just for documentation. And of course, there were some people that wanted to make sure for themselves if they could open the multipass device without, without leaving traces. Yeah, this is some traces you can see. Uh, mass production. So you have, uh, you have a prototype that you hand assembled, hand assembled that you know should be easy uh, to produce later. So of course, before going to the mass production, you run some prototype runs. In our case, for the multipass, I think we ran two prototype runs, two prototype runs of 50 units each, uh, either for testers or for uh, developers. Uh, so these prototype runs were partially funded by the contributors themselves, uh, people who were really eager to have this device literally paid for the units and we reimbursed them later. So this allowed us to fund our prototype runs. How do you find uh, some assembly house? So we chose to go to, the, to China. Strangely enough, they, they were faster to answer, they were faster to iterate and we could have a good discussion with them. I mean, Switzerland, people are very slow. So Ch Chinese seem eager to, uh, to work with us and the prices were reasonable, so why not? Uh, how do you pick one? Uh, this is a funny story. I bought a power supply on the internet, connected it to my uh, house uh, power mains, and it blew up the fuse. I contacted the guy, and then I learned that he was, he, he was doing uh, contract, contract manufacturing. And this is how we had <laughs> our first mass, mass production. We had no problem. It's just that it was just the exception. Uh, so. We have one guy for the device assembly and we have another guy for the, for the CNC machining. Uh, funny story, how do you pick someone, how do you find someone in China? It's always tricky. In my case, I contacted, I think, 20 different uh, uh, CNC shops on Alibaba. And because we were in the prototype uh, phase, I figured, hey, let's pick the cheapest one. And actually, this, the guy I, I, I picked was the most reliable, reliable one. So in conclusion, you never know what you get until you try. Best conclusion, right? Uh, communication is always tricky. Uh, see, so if you're single, I advise you to do like I do. I picked a Chinese wife for translation. It's awesome. <laughs> Super. You, they understand some English, but actually, you know, the final points is well to ask your wife, hey, can you tell him to, if he understood what I said? It's like, you know, a back channel to make sure that, hey, I know my husband can be annoying sometimes. He's always pushing stuff for some stuff, but did you understand? So, yeah. Or have a Chinese friend in the worst case. Uh, how, so you have a device that is working well, and you want to make sure that it's, it is correctly produced. Uh, in the previous talk, we talked about um, say quality control. In my case, I design, we designed a firmware in such a way that the device will not boot up until it is functionally tested. 
So basically, on the first try, the first start, it is going to start the functional test. Uh, it requires the assembler to, uh, for example, scroll a wheel, insert a card, and if all these steps are correctly passed, then the device boots. So this makes sure that no device is shipped out until it is correctly tested. This is a very important point. You want to have a functional test that is uh, say accurate enough that you don't have any unknowns in the future because you can be sure that anything you forget is going to bite you in the ass later, for sure. Uh, how do you explain a Chinese assembler a functional test that you have done? Uh, you can go there. You can go to China. I've been there uh, twice to explain them how to do it. In my opinion, I still prefer to make a quick video. So, for example, you want to explain them how to assemble a device. That goes for the Chinese, but that goes for anyone you work with, basically. You want to explain them how to assemble a device. It's simple. You assemble it yourself, and you film yourself. And then you send the, vi the video link to your contractor manufacturer that can watch it four, five, six times, as many times as he wants, so he can understand how that works. It's still better than them faking that they understand and asking you later. It's better if everything is already there on video so they can understand how it works. But of course, there, is, there are always stuff that you can't plan for. Uh, for example, in our case, we use adhesive. Uh, the assembler just put glue, put the two parts together, and didn't let it dry. So we had like glue marks everywhere for the first beta units. This is why I said at least make a couple of production of um, prototype runs, 50, 100 units, so you can see what the different things you never thought of. Uh, in our case, it was letting the glue dry. You'd think you would have specified in the, in the quality control document to uh, let it dry for a couple of hours on a flat surface, but yeah, anyway, that happens. So now we have talked about the different cases, the mechanical cases. We're going to talk about the firmware. Uh, I'm going to go quickly, uh, depending on if you're interested or not. Most of the firmware of the multipass devices were done by the contributors, except all the encryption routines. Uh, we are not going to reinvent the wheel. Encryption is reserved to the masters. I'm not really a cryptographer, so we use the library, but we design all the tests in order to make sure that they were beha behaving correctly. You can find on the internet, for example, in the case of AES, that you, you have vectors, vector sets that allows you to make sure that the encryption routines are working correctly. We have an encrypt storage. Of course, we are not going to uh, store your credentials in clear inside the multipass uh, memory. We have, uh, you can store logins, password, and also some data. We offer, we offer a small file storage, uh, small file storage feature. Uh, everything coded from, from the ground up. Uh, to store the encryption key. Uh, to the contrary of Trezor, where, for example, all the encryption keys are stored inside the device, we use a secure element to store the encryption key. Uh, this smart card uh, is locked. It's basically it's a read-protected uh, read memory, as simple as that. And you need a pin code to access, to access the contents, to access the, the AES key. Uh, surprisingly enough, it's extremely hard to find a smart card for your own means, because any manufacturer out there won't sell you any secure elements. Uh, you're, you don't want to, well, they don't want to sell anything in less than a million quantities for secure devices, and they really don't want to sell anything to open source enthusiasts. Yeah, I don't want to, they don't want their data sheet to be online, as simple as that. Uh, so in our case, this particular smart card, you can, it's, I think it's a smart card from Atmel, it's already 10 years old, but it's simple enough, and it does what we want, just a read protected memory, we don't need more than that. Random number generation. Uh, on Hacker Day, uh, you may have seen that uh, so random number generation is always a hot topic. Uh, if your random number generator is not, uh, is, is not good enough, it may generate an encryption key that is well known. So in our case, we use a random number generator that is based on the jitter between the crystal, uh, the microcontroller crystal, and the watchdog, the watchdog timer. It generates eight bytes a second which is not a lot, but which is exactly what we need because we just use it to generate an encryption key and some padding for some different encryption uh, functions. USB. Uh, USB stack, we used, uh, we based our USB stack on the work from uh, Paul Strofengen. Uh, so it, it is a USB composite, uh, composite which means that it has a HID keyboard. You remember from the previous video that it types logins and passwords for you on any device. 
but it also um, allows native browser integration, so which this is what we call uh, HID proprietary, which is a fancy way of saying that we are sending 64 bytes of data every millisecond. So this allows you to implement your own communication channel to, uh, for the browser to ask the multipass, hey, I want that login for that website, and all the communication is going through this HID uh, channel. Uh, one very annoying thing is that uh, in the case of HID keyboard, when you press a key on your keyboard, it's not telling your, your operating system to type A. It's telling your operating system that, hey, this user has typed the, has pressed the key whose unique identifier is, for example, 52. And then it is up to the operating system to convert that 52 to the letter A or B or whatever. And this uh, conversion uh, is basically the local, local, local that you configured on your computer. So if you're using, for example, a French keyboard, an American keyboard, the 52 is going to map either to a Q or, or an A. So how do you generate unique keyboards to uh, ASCII characters inside the multipass because the multipass send needs to send unique key codes to basically type an A. You make a fancy Python script that is going to, ah, you don't see much, that is basically going to brute force every key combination in order to see what uh, unique key code matches to each uh, character. Graphics library. So for our graphics library, we designed we design everything from the ground up. We have uh, very high speed constraints and we don't have a lot of space. So we design all, a lot of different Python tools in order to convert bitmaps into uh, bit streams and also different fonts and texts. We use run length encoding and uh, it can be securely updated using a bootloader. So now that you've designed, uh, so we've designed a secure firmware. You want to make sure that it is not riddled with security flaws. Uh, luckily enough, because you publish something on Hackaday, you have some different security groups that contact you in order to analyze the firmware you have done. So in our case, we had many different uh, people contact us to basically just run some different security, security analysis on our firmware. Then they give you a huge Excel file to make sure, hey, this function, in case you give that at the input, uh, maybe this doesn't behave correctly. So. This is also a lot of work, making sure that it's correctly, it's correctly implemented. In our case, we didn't have bad surprises. And once you have a firmware, how do you flash it to your device? How do you make sure that the, the firmware you have is the one that is flashed on your, on your microcontroller? In our case, yeah, you can't see it clearly, we designed our own programming ring. So I will let you imagine, imagine me spending three days putting microcontrollers on a bench, closing the bench, pressing a button, just to program thousands of microcontrollers, just to make sure that the firmware is the one on the microcontroller, I programmed everything. It was a lengthy three days. Multipass software. So uh, we started at a low level, the me mechanical case, then we talked about the firmware, and then we are gonna talk a bit high level, uh, how the multipass communicates with your browser. So we have different tools. We have uh, one that was created by a contributor, uh, it's called Multipy, uh, it's a Python tool that basically allows you to access all the Multipass features uh, using a command line based interface. So basically, please spit out, spit out this particular password for this particular service. What is quite nice is that you can call that script from any application. For any application you develop, you call, you call Multipy, Multipy to access the different credentials. And we also have a Chrome, Chrome app and ext an extension. So, Imagine our problematic. You have a device and you need to make it work on Windows, Linux, uh, and Mac. Are you really going to spend, I don't, I don't know, how many thousands of hours trying to make some boilerplate code in order to make sure that your, your application works on every OS? In our case, we just used Chrome as a first step uh, to prototype uh, the communication between the multipass and uh, the computer. Why? Chrome because it provides low-level libraries for USB. So basically, you just just you just keep busy, you just work on the part to communicate with the multipass, and all the low-level stuff is taken care of by Chrome. Uh, this was our first approach. So some people are not going to like that, but you can actually convert Chrome applications into standalone application using Electron. This is really dirty uh, because basically it's running a browser 
inside the application in order to <laughs> make your Chrome app work, so it was a bit dirty. But what we have right now is our new tool, so Multicute, so basically you have a daemon uh, running all the time on your computer that is basically just in, in charge of the communications between your multipass and the computer. To this daemon, we'll, we'll talk different uh, tools, so it can be the Chrome, Safari, or Firefox extension, or you can has also have just a user interface that allows you to uh, configure the different uh, logins and passwords on your device, but also change, uh, export your database. So uh, you may see here what the user interface looks like. Uh, you can see all your database. Everything is coded on Qt, so it runs natively on, uh, on any OS. It's really great. Uh, very low level, so all the source code is managed by us. It was originally uh, developed by someone. Uh, he worked on this tool for five months, and eventually we saw that it was, uh, it, it, it made sense to migrate to a standalone app that was created from the bottom up, so now all the Multipass team is working on it. And we, as I mentioned, we're also storing and recording files on the Multipass itself. What's next? Next Multipass device. Uh, I'll give you a quick glance of what we are, uh, what we are working on in case you're interested. Uh, we're working on the wireless version of the, of the multipass with Bluetooth. Bluetooth, I know that you're gonna say that it's not really secure. Of course, so for, in that case, we have in the same PCB, we have a secure domain and we have an insecure domain. You have two microcontrollers, an insecure microcontroller that is going to take care of the communication with the outside world uh, using USB or Bluetooth. And once all this uh, data is gathered on the unsecure microcontroller, it's going to make all the requests and all the operations by talking to the secure microcontroller. This allows you uh, to really have a boundary between the secure domain and the unsecure domain and still use Bluetooth, even if you have seen all the different attacks. But let's be realistic, having a device that is on your pocket to store your logins and password that you need to connect using USB to all your devices is not that convenient, right? You need to have a cable all the time, so Bluetooth is a logical next step because you people in the end want convenience, right? So if you are interested in working on the, on the firmware, uh, we are moving to Unicode, so basically we are kind of starting from the ground up again. Uh, we, are, we want to implement a new database, we want to int integrate uh, two-factor authentication, and we are still working on new features for the multi queued application that, that you have seen before. Uh, this is not only hardware stuff. We are, we, if you want to contribute on uh, user interface design or packaging or designing the multipass casing, uh, basically we are, we are starting anew. So everything is possible. And given that we have Bluetooth, now we, we are able to uh, make applications on your phone in order to manage your multipass. Do you have any questions? I did not trust my computer. <laughs> yeah, you, s you see every day these different flows on, on, on computers, on any operating system. Lately, it has been the Intel management interface, so whatever you do on your computer, eh, too late. So I did not trust my computer, so in the end, I wanted to like, have a device dedicated to it. Uh, the, of course, the credentials are still going through your computer, but they're going through your computer only for, like, like what, 20 milliseconds? So you are reducing the attack surface to a very strict minimum, which is like if you were typing yourself your logins and passwords on the computer. So what happens if you lose the, lose the, I don't know what to, I forgot what to call it. The device. Yeah. So if you lose, no, you, if you lose the device, that's not a problem because you have the possibility to export all your encrypted database. So. Uh, at any point, you export your database and you may, import into, you may import it to another device. So this forces you to buy another device, but if you don't want to use another device, we also have some tools that allows you to decrypt the exported database. Of, of course, this goes directly against our security model because that, that would mean that you would be able to decrypt all your credentials on your computer. So basically, that would render the multipass useless. Um, what do you do with all the extra money? 
We reinvest it all the time. Okay. Yeah, basically, I'm not paid by this project. Uh, the PayPal account right now is not bad. As, as uh, Jasmine said, we are getting some sales. It's actually a, a pleasant surprise. But, uh, for example, in the last two months, I think we have spent 10K on hiring some uh, different uh, C++ developers to implement some features that I wanted to, uh, to have it out there. Uh, and we are also going to use these funds, for example, uh, if we uh, to go to the Bluetooth certification process, this is going to be very expensive. Like, I think it's going to be between 10K and 20K, so this is some money we want to have saved. And yes, anyways, we will also use this money to fund a new prototype run, because, yeah, this will be required. This will be a bit more expensive, because the device is gonna, uh, gonna have a bit more components. But yeah, we are not we are not cashing out. It would be a bit hypocritical from our side, anyway. So yeah, uh, but what we are doing right now, actually, for the next generation, because we are going to uh, we are starting to have some money, is asking every contributor to log their time uh, to, for example, if this gets really successful, if we start selling in ten, tens of thousands in, instead of hundreds. Uh, so if someone, if we see that maybe we can start working full-time on it, then people can get uh, parts of a future company based on how many hours they would have worked on. Because if this is starting to be really serious, uh, so if you want to work on it, we really encourage, it, encourage you, please log your hours to make sure that at the end, eventually, if this goes big, we have a trace of how many hours. It's not in, uh, it's not in, in a way like, please log your hours so, you know if, so I can know if you've worked or not. I don't care, you work, you, you don't work, that's fine. It's just like, if you're gonna work so many hours, so many nights, so many, uh, during all the weekend, I want you to get something out of it. Uh, along the lines of uh, building a successful uh, type of open source uh, device, have you consulted with uh, a lawyer to figure out what is the liability and how is it distributed among the, the people who contribute to the design, especially on subject that might involve cybersecurity? Oh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> not really. Uh, 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 there may be a disclaimer on our website on, on that purpose. Uh, anyway, I'm not sh even for most secure devices, uh, you have some certifications. Say, oh, for example, you pass this kind of test, but you never have a strong guarantee. When there is a security flaw, for example, on LastPass, they never had to, to pay anything to the customers. So it's like, okay, you have a tool, we provide a service. It's all in our own interest to have your credentials safe. If there is something that happens, yeah. But we passed uh, FCC C certifications. Uh, we are looking into FIPS 430. Uh, this is going to be also very expensive, so this is why uh, the extra cash would be useful. Um, did the security researchers find any exploits that you were able to fix? Nope. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Nope, there was one edge case, uh, like really edgy, but yeah, in the end we both agreed that it was not a security flow. And uh, anyway, it was, yeah, it was so far-fetched. It was some, uh, for example, mem compare, some, some functions like that, how you use it. It's just, hey, let's rewrite it just for the sake of it. But yeah, we, anyway, the people that worked on the firmware were paranoid enough that they wouldn't, like they, every time they were writing a line of code, they would think, okay, if I was an attacker, how would I abuse that? No question? Thank you. <laughs>